Thanks for tuning into today's podcast. Before we begin, I'd like to tell you a little bit about our new remote training here at RPP. We've been offering remote training for quite some time, but we always required the athlete to come in-house for an assessment. Now we can do the whole assessment online and bring all of our services, pitching, hitting, and strength training to your doorstep. So if you like what we do and how we do it, go to our website at rocklandpeakperformance.com and click on remote training in the toolbar. Thanks. The Behind the Seams Podcast. I'm your host, Nunzio Signore, looking to bring you great dialogue with some of the best in the world of player development. The world of training baseball players has changed dramatically during the past few years, and I'm looking forward to shedding some light here on what's the latest, what's the best, and what's really happening in the world of player development. Thanks for joining me for the ride. Hey guys, thanks for tuning into the Behind the Scenes podcast. Today, I've got Descahe Bomberry. Great, Iroquois Indian name I just found out. He's otherwise known as Coach Bomber, as everybody knows him, as I know him from. And I met Bomber at Palooza a while back. I just had been following him on social media, and we've been exchanging messages back and forth. And he's another one of those guys that I like to interview that you know, is a little more forward thinking. He's trying to check all the boxes and look in all the buckets. And these are the kind of guys I'm trying to bring on as far as player development goes. He began his 18th season as a Panther. He's the pitching coach and recruiting coordinator at Sac City. And he is pretty much an institution on the West Coast. Since coming to Sac City, 49 pitchers have transferred to NCAA Division I universities. 17 have signed professional contracts and four have reached the major leagues. At Sac City, Bomber is responsible for all aspects of the pitching staff development and coordinates the Panthers' recruiting. He began his collegiate coaching career in 1996 at Eastern Kentucky University. He was responsible for the development of the pitching staff there and coordinated their recruiting efforts as well. In 2000, he served as the assistant coach for the Chatham A's in the Cape Cod League, where eight players from that team went on to play in the major leagues. He has also spent the last three summers assisting USA Baseball with the selection of the 18U national team. He has a BA from Sonoma State in Business Administration and a master's degree in physical education from Eastern Kentucky University, which uh, makes a lot of sense to me, um, which we'll get into a little bit more later. I'd like to welcome to the show, Coach Bomber. How's life been treating you out there on the West Coast? Good, man. Thanks for having me on. Super excited to do this. It's great, man. I'm, I was just telling you before we got on air here that I'm, a, I'm always a little jealous of you guys. You know, I, I interviewed Jerry Weinstein a couple of weeks ago, and I, every time I interview some of these guys from the West Coast, they always look so damn relaxed. I'm like, I, I just, I, 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 I've spent time out there, and and you're even more. You're, you're, you're in Northern California. That's yeah, where Jerry, where Jerry lives is like paradise. Like I would, I would move there in a second. I just can't afford to live there. Right. Well, I mean, Northern California is, is ain't cheap either. No, but it's so he lives in what is considered the Central Coast, and I mean it's it's gorgeous. So, I'm gonna t I'm gonna tell you that was a uh, that was a life learning experience. That was a life learning experience with him on the show. He he's just such an incredible wealth of knowledge. I it, like I could have talked to that guy for hours. So he was at Sac City. My when I first got to Sac City, he was still there. So I got to spend um, a semester with him, you know, working side by side. And then he got a job with the Dodgers. Um, I believe at the time as their catching coordinator. Uh, we've always he's been great. Like we always stay in touch. We probably talk at least once a month. Um, and, you know, I'll have some crazy idea to run by him about something and he either gives me the thumbs up or the thumbs down. Yeah, he always Usually, has... usually he gives you the it depends answer, which which is what I think a lot of smart people. Yeah, do. he's 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 very politically correct. I I I I, li I, I like that about him. He, I've never heard him say a bad word about anyway. You probably know him better than I do, but I've I, anytime I've spoken with him on 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 the uh on the on the speaking tours, I've I've never heard him say a bad thing about anybody. 
Um, let's let's start off by telling us a little bit about your baseball path and how you ended up at Sac City from all the way from like college. So I went to I went to a JC. I went to Casimnas River College here in Sacramento, um, and then I transferred to Sonoma State. Um, and I was there. I was actually there for three years. I got hurt, um, so I sat out a year. I was never a very good college player. I was an okay college player. Um, but I, when I was in junior college, I realized that coaching was something that I wanted to do. I really wasn't sure how I was going to make it happen. Um, but my junior college coach, a guy named Rod Bilby, was just an awesome, awesome person. Um, and he, he had actually asked me if I wanted to be an umpire, and he was going to send me to umpiring school. And I was like, no, nah, I don't want to spend my life getting yelled at. I said, but I want to coach. He said, well, uh, let me see if I can help you out with that. He's like, do you know what level? I said, well, I, you know, I like the junior college level. He's like, well, this is what you need to do. You have to get a master's degree and, you know, most of your job is teaching. And so he started incorporating me into like staff meetings and uh, he would take me out recruiting with him and just kind of, you know, like, this is what I'm looking for. This is the type of player that I like, Um, you know, go over practice planning with me and stuff. And so he was really kind of the, the inspiration for me to get into coaching. And then once I graduated from Sonoma State, I knew I needed to get into a, a master's program somehow. And I wanted to be a graduate assistant. And it just worked out perfectly. One of my really good friends, uh, Rob Cooper, coached at Penn State. Um, he was actually coaching at Wake Forest at the time. And one of their assistant coaches knew and had coached with the head coach at Eastern Kentucky. Uh, and they had had some contact about trying to find a GA, and uh, Rob got wind of it. Rob called me. He's like, hey, this could happen. Do you want to do it? I'm like, yeah, man, I got nothing to do. I just, just graduated college. I don't have a job. I was, I was actually a bartender at the time. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm in. So, literally, I, 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 I talked to the coach two or three times. He's like, if you can – score high enough on the graduate record exam, the GRE, um, it's like the job jerks. So I took the test, I got into grad school, and then sight unseen, packed all my stuff up and moved to Kentucky. I'd never been to Kentucky. I had nowhere to live. Wow, that's a, that's a was, wild place going. to be moving to. That's I was like- going. And, you know, I, I spent two years there, and the head coach at the time, it was Jim Ward. Uh, he was had a great reputation, uh, and I think the the best thing that he did for me was he let me coach, and he let me make mistakes. And <laughs> trust me, you know, at tw- I guess I had been twenty three or twenty four. There was a lot, lot of, of mistakes. Yeah, <laughs> lot. I look back now, I'm like those guys I coached back then should should all sue me for fraud because I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Um, but they, they kind of listened. And then, so I finished graduate school, uh, you know, and in my head at the time, I just thought, man, I'm going to have all these jobs just falling into my lap. And, you know, it doesn't really work that way. And so uh, Andy McKay, who was an assistant coach at Sac City for Jerry, uh, we were friends and he called me. He's like, hey, you know, I don't know what you have going on. Um but if you don't get a job here in the next few weeks, um, you know, we can get you teaching part time here at the school. You'll help Jerry with the pictures. You can learn from them. And, you know, we'll see where it goes. And so um, you know, nothing popped up. And so I called them up. I called my parents and said, hey, I'm going to move home for a little while. Uh, slept on their couch for like a year uh, until I kind of got my feet underneath me. and. It's kind of been at Sac City ever since. That's that's awesome. I want to actually focus a little bit on what you call what would you call what we would call the JUCO path. Uh, so how do you how do you feel that JUCO has changed during the past ten to twenty years of you being in it? Uh, I think there's a few things. I think so. If you go back twenty years, um, I need to update my bio on the website because I'm a lot older than the website says I am. Uh, but we won't say anything. <laughs> we won't say nothing. Uh, 
I would think like one of the biggest changes I've seen that we've we've been affected by is just Division One recruiting. Um, you know, you go back twenty years, and you know there were a handful of schools that would be out recruiting, um, and they were really aggressive. They're really good at it. Now, every D1 school has aggressive recruiters that are out there just crushing it and they're on the road and they're working hard. And there are more events now for kids to get exposed. So I think you're seeing more kids uh, are going right from high school to four-year schools than in the past. Um, when I first got to Sac City, you know, good players really didn't go to kind of like that mid-major school very often, uh, at least not around here. Uh, they would rather um, take their chances at a JUCO for a couple of years and then see if they could go to like a power five type of school. Right. Uh, that really doesn't happen uh, as often anymore. Uh, you know, 20 years ago, it was almost unheard of for a high school kid to take like a D2 offer or an NAI offer. Um, those kids take those offers now. Um, and I think a lot of it has to do with, you know, the club ball scene and the travel ball scene. And, you know, parents are trying to get a return on their investment and right. going to the JUCO is not always the sexiest thing in the world. Uh, but I think the other thing too, that, uh, you know, if you remember back in the day, the whole draft and follow thing with MLB teams, like that was a big deal. You know, you would get a kid who who was probably committed to a, a Pac-12 school or, you know, a Big West school, um, but didn't want to spend three years there. He wanted to spend a year in school and then try to sign. Right. So you were you were getting, you know, you had an opportunity to get a fairly high profile uh, kid to show up on your JUCO campus because they wanted to sign. Like the year before I got to Sac City. There was a kid named Matt Riley who showed up on campus. He was a third round draft pick. And he didn't get the money he wanted. So he right. came to a JC. Like, right. And so there were those types of stories where these high profile guys would show up on JC campuses. And that 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 doesn't happen anymore. So I think it's a combination of I think four year schools are much more aggressive. They're a lot better at recruiting. Um, there are more events, so kids are getting more exposure. Um and I think the draft and follow thing has really kind of changed the landscape. And so uh, the players are just a little bit different, you know. Um, we're going to talk about that in a, in, in a minute. Um, who, who do you feel the JUCO route is most appropriate for, for, for parents that are out there and, and guys that are, that are trying to figure out what to do? Um, give us a little bit of a feel for who you think, um, you know, a JUCO, what kind of a athlete or kind of player or position you're in that you would feel that a ju the JUCO route is most appropriate for? I think a, a couple guys kind of fit fit the profile, I guess. I think any kid who just doesn't have what he wants yet, um, you know, if he wants to be a Division One player and he's not ready yet, and that could be, I mean, you know, it could be any number of reasons. He doesn't throw hard enough. He's not strong enough. Uh, maybe academically he's not ready. Uh, so any kid who doesn't have what he wants yet uh, is a good Juco candidate. Um, you know, if a kid's got some kind of mid-major interest, but he wants to go to Power 5 type school, Juco is a good place for that kid. Um, and I also think, you know, really good players who want to start their professional careers a little bit sooner as opposed to later. Um, I think JUCO is a really good spot for them. Um, you know, we have, I guess we have some practice rules. We don't have very many, right? I know at the NCAA level, like they've got fairly strict rules, 20 hours a week, you know, this many hours a day. Like we don't have those limitations. So we can spend way more time with our guys. Um, and I think we can kind of speed up the development a little bit just because of the amount of time that we have with them. I was just going to ask you about that. Like, it seems like because 
Juco, it becomes like a, a, a stepping, a, 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 like a pit stop, so to say, for guys who feel like maybe they're waiting for a bigger school and maybe they're waiting to, um, they need some work, whether it's mechanics wise or hitting wise, or they just need to get a bigger body or they just need to get a little bit more athletic. I think a lot of these guys, maybe if, correct me if I'm wrong, a lot of these guys get to Juco and like for you, like a guy like you who has a master's degree in physical education, and um, we'll talk about the, the amount that I see you working out on social media all the time. I, find, I love that. Um, I think that a guy like you is a valuable guy to these guys because um, I think that a lot of, a lot of like quote unquote player development be, is, is important in JUCO because these guys are using it as a stop to get some work done. Yeah, you know, I think uh, – let me preface this by saying I really love to win, and I I despise losing. And when we lose a game, it, it impacts me like everybody else. But at the same time, we don't have to win games in order for us to keep our jobs. And the reason I say that is that we can – place more of an emphasis on developing that player and helping that player figure out what he needs. That's and invaluable. That's best invaluable. That player without necessarily worrying about if that kid, you know, is going to help us win the next game. You know, so we don't have to have a kid pitch back to back dates. We don't have to have a kid start on Tuesday and then try to close on Saturday because we have to win. Like, we don't ever have to do that. We don't have to run a kid out there for 130 pitches because we need to win that game. We don't have to do that. You know, we tell our guys all the time, like, the things that will win a junior college game, they may not win a game in the Southeastern Conference. They're not going to win a game at an NCAA Division I regional. And we coach them with that in mind. Like, you know, there are certain things you can do in a JC game as a pitcher and if you're pretty good at them, you have a really good chance of being successful, right? But it just doesn't scale. It's not going to work at the next level. Uh, I, the, the example I give when I'm recruiting a kid and we talk about this specific thing is like if I'm a math teacher on our campus and you take my math class, if you transfer to UCLA and you can't pass the next math class, I did a terrible job as a teacher, right? right? But it's the same thing as a coach. Like if you know, if you can't leave our program and go to a Division One school and be prepared and be successful, then we may not have done our job. Yep. So we spend a lot of time with that in mind, you know, and sometimes it's, you know, it works with professional guys the same way. Like there are certain things that guys need to, if they really want to sign that they're going to have to do that may interfere, you know, if you're trying to develop a pitch. The best way to develop a pitch is by throwing it against real hitters who are trying to get hits. Right. Right. So uh, we might give up a hit. We might give up a run trying to help a guy develop a pitch in a game, right? A real game with consequences. And we're okay with that. Like that's just something that's that goes back to to Jerry, you know, when Jerry was the head coach. It's always been a program that was more concerned with player development than anything else. You guys win, though. So, I mean. Well, so, again, I, I think that there's this misconception that if you're developing players, you can't develop your team. Right. That's what I'm I saying. I think you just have to have windows, right? So you have your fall. We have a long fall. We don't have a five-week fall like an NCAA school. We have – we'll be out there for 12 or 13 weeks. So for 12 or 13 weeks, it is 95% about the individual and helping him become the best version of himself. When the calendar changes and now it's January and we're getting ready for the season, now it becomes more about us and team um, and kind of a, a de-emphasis on individual development to an extent. Like, you know, if, you know, your Rapsodo numbers are not what they want them to be in March, I'm not going to be as concerned with it as I would be in October. Right. In October, we're going to go, let's, let's go bang that out. You know, in March, it's going to be more like, okay, well, we can try to work on this, but on Thursday, I'm going to need you to go out there and compete. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's your it's, yeah. numbers. Yeah. And so when you can develop players and you can develop people, 
um, and then you put them into a team setting, you have better weapons, you have better tools. Uh, and I think a lot of times we, we coaches are so caught up in winning, and I trust me, I get it, um, that they put the team in front of the individual pretty much all the time. Which can actually be a catch-22 when, like you, like you just said, in order to win games. I think sometimes when, like you said, in a JUCO, where we're equally as concerned or maybe even more concerned with developing the athlete instead of winning, you end up winning because you've developed an athlete. And now you have, like you said, you have a higher arsenal of guys that you've actually been doing work on, you know, For instead sure. of instead of just calling a guy up from, from, from high school that, that was a stud his whole life, and now he gets into D1 schools where everyone's a stud, maybe he's not that much of a stud anymore, you know what I mean? But yeah. he makes the stop in, in a juco, and he builds his body up a little bit more, or he works on his hitting mechanics or his pitching mechanics. That's a very interesting, that's a very interesting point about by not worrying so much about winning and worrying more about the individual development, you end up winning sometimes more. That's a, that's a great lesson. Uh, let's talk about the NCAA one-year waiver rule in the transfer portal. Um, I believe the waiver is turning recruiting on its head. So how do, you, how, how do you think this is changing recruiting for both high school players and for collegiate athletes and for JUCO? You know, I think uh... – Let's start with the high school guys. I think the high school guys obviously are going to be the most severely impacted. Yep. yep. Um, I think, you know, and, I, and I, I don't mean this, if you have, you know, high school kids listening to this, I don't mean to scare them, but I think if you're a high school player who doesn't commit early to a Division I school, I, I don't think there's going to be a ton of, um, like yeah. spring Division One commitment to high school players. I just don't think it's going to happen anymore, well, at least not at a very high rate, because these guys will just go and swoop players up out of the portal, right? If you can, you can gamble on a high school senior, right, who put up pretty good numbers in high school, or you can gamble on a guy who's produced for two years at the Division One level, that's a pretty easy decision, right? Yeah. You're going to take you're going to take the established guy, you know, yeah. 95% of the time. In the trenches. You know, that kid's already proven that he can play at the Division One level. Um, so I think that group is going to be impacted the most. I think it's going to become more severe as they move forward just because the NCAA is going back to the old roster limitations. So now there's just fewer spots available. Um, I think, you know, it's kind of hard because I think a lot of the mid-majors are going to have probably more access to, um, like the high school senior who might blossom late, but the mid-major is also losing players to power five schools. Right. You know, it's almost like, it's almost like the, the mid-majors have become another version of JUCOs for a lot of the Power 5 schools. I mean, you just you watch the portal and how it works. And, um, you know, I, I, I don't think it's a good thing. Uh, I really don't. Um, I think at the highest levels, you know, what I think a lot of people are not, maybe they don't pay attention to it or they're just not aware of it, is that NIL money, that name, image, and likeness money, that's why a lot of these dudes are leaving. Yeah. They're going to go somewhere where they're going to get paid. Right. The NCAA has made that possible. Yeah. That's, I don't know what, I don't know what to say about that. Right. And so that is a big, big deal. Right. If you can leave your mid major and, and go somewhere and make a bunch of money, you know, because it's legal now, right. That, that's a pretty slippery slope. Um, and I think, and it's similar for JUCO guys. Like, you know, I we're as a season got towards the end and we're trying to place our guys who weren't placed. And, you know, a lot of D1 schools just like, hey, we're going to wait and see what shakes out in the portal. Right. You know, and sometimes it's just recruiting your own players back. Because <laughs> not every guy who goes into the portal actually leaves. You know, they kind of see what's out there. And some of them just go back to where they were because of the coaching change or, you know, whatever it might be. I think shit. It, Go ahead, Ken. Sorry. I, I think it's, it's, you know, I talked to a, a, a Power 5 assistant coach, and he, he thought the, the, the portal 
and the NIL money is like going to have a horrible, horrible impact on college baseball. Yeah. And he's right in the middle. Like he's doing it because that's his job. But the whole, the the whole picture, thing, the whole thing since COVID has been crazy and it's, it's even shaken down. I mean, like guys, guys hanging around, like you said, less, less available scholarships and guys actually hanging around. It's making it really, really like as panicked as I always see it in the private sector, as panicked as I always see young kids, uh, parents, they walk in now even more wide eyed. They're, they 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 just look like a deer in headlights. They don't know what to do. There's this, there's this franticness that starts to happen right now with yeah. these, with, with everyone. Um, and I'm even seeing in the summer, I'm seeing guys that used to spend the summer here, um, working their stuff on a local team. Um, and getting most of their work done in here, throwing and lifting wise, I'm seeing in the summertime, these last couple summers, uh, guys are like, you know, guys are playing baseball. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, like it's just like, they, they kind of, they, a lot of them have to. Yeah. You know there, I mean? There's guys out here doing the same thing. You know, you know, there are a handful of kids uh, that are going to go to a Juco out here that haven't committed to one yet because they think they have a chance to get a scholarship, you know, this summer. And I, I don't want to be, yeah. you know, like the, the Grim Reaper. Reaper and just going, hey, man, <laughs> it's not going to happen. Like you're not that type of player when you have 2,400 players or more now in the transfer portal, like no division one program is looking for a high school player right now. That's, you know, yeah, figure the class of 2024, sure. But if you're a recent high school graduate, like a division one school is just not going to be interested in you when you have all these kids in the portal. It's just not going to happen. Uh, I, I heard you say, um, changing gears a little bit, I heard you say, or I read somewhere um, that you said that high school players that want to play at the next level need to work on their body. Can you please uh, talk a bit about that? I mean, I constantly talk about it. Maybe someone who actually um, is 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 recruiting guys and in, in, is in a very developmental scene with JUCOs. You can talk about that a bit. Yeah, I, I think the the biggest difference between a high school senior and a college freshman or sophomore is just strength. You know, I, I very few high school programs have great strength training programs um not necessarily because it's their fault they just there's no space there's no time there's, there's probably, no coach there's that there's probably no one who knows anything about you know strength training um there's probably a handful of high school coaches who still think that if you lift weights you're going to get too big and not be able to throw and, yeah you're going to you know, get tight those, you're going to get tight things yeah that still exists uh but I think when you can take uh, that high school senior who's who has baseball skill, right? You would agree that when a guy is going to a junior college or he's not going to the type of school that he wants to go to yet, very rarely is it the baseball skills that are getting in the way. One hundred percent. Like they've been playing baseball since they were seven or eight years old. Like they know how to throw the ball they know how to swing a bat they know how they should try to field the ground ball it's just that when they swing the bat the ball isn't going anywhere I, I i tell guys all the time listen man you you're a stud here okay you're a stud this north bergen new york city area you're a stud okay you're getting ready to go to a division one school and you're going to be on a team where all these guys were studs in their town OK, yeah. and the deciding factor of who's going to excel is strength. No and doubt. I feel like exactly what you said, that kind of levels the playing field um, all the like that kind of levels the playing field out. Um, and then it makes guys rise to the top like cream. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. I'm, and it's, it's really it's really an important thing. So are you. Are you involved in your player strength training programs? The reason I ask this is because I'm always seeing you doing hang cleans at home, and I'm not that I'm a not not that I'm a proponent of high hang cleans, but um, 
I see you working out. You work out. You work out hard. And also, I will say, um, you called me up. I did. A, I did a. I did a. <clears throat> I did a blog on the fo- on a fascial circuit that I I put together for my guys. Um, you texted me immediately. I think I, I that I, that blog was out for an hour, and you texted me and said, "Hey man, can you tell me a little bit more about that? Um, what do you think? Um, do you think I I believe that it's one of the biggest things." game changers for kids. And I was like, wow, that's really great that there's a pitching coach that's talking about how fascia is the, the one of the game changing things. Cause it is, um, yeah. is one of the game changing things. So did that work out for you? That, that, that what I sent you? Yeah. So we had guys, um, we would do that on our non-lifting days. Right. Uh, we days. would do it on days when guys <coughs> feel great. Um, and we did it. We have guys doing it the summer. Um, yeah, I mean, I so they hate I, doing it. it. They hate doing it. But, but yeah, it's you know, but and I, they really hate it when you tell them. You know, it's going to take like 12, 14 15 months minutes. before, 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 before yeah. you ever figure out if it's actually working. <laughs> right, so, and it know, takes so. you twenty minutes twice a week to do it. Yeah. So uh, I had heard. Um, I think it is it Bill Parisi who wrote the book about the fascial training. Yes, situation. he wrote a book on it. Yeah. So I heard him on a podcast and listening to him, I'm like, oh my God, like this, this is like this low hanging fruit kind of that probably no one else has done. So whenever I hear these things, that I swear to God, it's, I always look at it from a competitive edge window and how can I help our guys? And if we can, you know, if running them through a fascial circuit for two years, um, helps tighten up their body and they can increase their velo or they're going to stay healthier. I mean, I mean, I, I, I am okay. Um, kind of dabbling in something that I never did, but I made, that's why, I, that's why I reached out to you. Cause I don't, you know, listening to him, it sounded like the perfect thing, but I didn't know how to train it. Right. I didn't know what to do to help them train the fascial system. And that's why I reached out to you. Cause I figured that, you know, you're out there on the cutting edge you would probably know and i would course. tell you i'll tell you that my guys i'm like if i'm looking out my window right now of my office and i'm watching guys doing it right now and i'm going to tell you that it's a one it's one that and using bar speeds to track uh to track mm-hmm. training adaptations those two things in the last three to three years for me have i have seen i've been I, my place has been open about 15 years in the last three years four years um, the, the, our guys get better every year. They have gotten exponentially better, like o- over, over the last three to four years with the, uh, with the inclusion of the fossil circuit and using VBT. Um, those yeah. two things are, they're pinpointing your training. Um, and the fact that you, you know, the fact that, you, that you're really, really into it, I, I was just curious as to how it was working for you because it is, it is a, if anyone out there is listening, um, you know, the fascia surrounds our muscles and in a really quick, brief way to explain it, it helps us produce more power with less muscular effort. Um, and what happened by, 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 by actually squeezing and contra- helping contract the muscle and releasing and, um, it, it really is a way that guys can become more explosive, and it even it's 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 really really great for the guys that don't have as as much um, uh, cross sectional fiber of their muscle. It's just really a great great way that um, guys with not as much muscle create power. It's how guys like these smaller guys like Walker Bueller and these dudes how they create that power. They just have a really good fossil system. That's it's it's a lot of it's genetic, but it can be trained and. Um, I had put it together, um, and Coach Bomber jumped on it, man. And that was, you know, what, one of the things that it, it was one of those kind of like aha moments because we've all been around those, like the guys you mentioned, right? The 5'11", 175-pound guy who throws 96. Exactly. Right? Like, 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 like that shouldn't happen just based on raw strength, but it does. We've all seen it. You know, the 5'11", 175 pound guy that can hit a ball over the scoreboard. Like that shouldn't happen, but it does. And, you know, we all, you know, as kind of older, old school baseball coaches, you know, we always knew there was something different, right? We described them as being twitchy and they're more right. athletic or whatever it was. 
but now there's there's science behind it, right? Now we know why those guys were able to do that. It's we're not guessing anymore. And now we know that it can be trained. Like you can help those guys improve that system. And, and you know, is everyone gonna start throwing super hard because their fascist fascial system got better? No, not not necessarily. They're gonna but, they're going to they're going to be able to do it with less effort and uh at less effort though and more consistently and the biggest thing is without actually um less risk of injury from yeah. having not having to try to recruit so hard. Yeah, and I, I think it's just to me, you know, when you're looking at trying to help a player, to me it's about checking all the boxes, right? Is he strong enough? Check. You know, uh, is he mobile enough? Check. Uh, are the mechanics good enough? Check. Has he gone through a VLO program? Check. Okay, so if you're still not seeing the results that you hope for, you kind of have to look okay, at well, what's next? Because right. I think, you know, in our, in our mind, I, I like the easy answer is, well, it's just genetics. Like he's, he's just not meant to throw 90 miles an hour or whatever it is. Like I, I don't necessarily believe that. You know, I think right. that, um, yeah, we all have a genetic ceiling, but it's probably a whole hell of a lot higher than we all think. And I think it's just too easy to go, well, he, that's just what he's going to be. Yeah, guys have a, guys have way. a high end range. They can like there's guys that genetically can get they they they're they're genetically capable of getting somewhere. It but but they may have not even tapped into it. You know what I mean? So the so the genetic potential is one thing. Doesn't mean that you shouldn't actually work on becoming more explosive because yeah. you, you can. That's and that's one of the questions that we have when, when we're recruiting. It's just to get an idea of someone's training history. Like, what have you done for the last two or three years? If you haven't been in a very good lifting program, great. That means that when we put you in a real one, then you might see some pretty crazy gains right away. Um, you know, guys who haven't been in a real throwing program or guys who are always a, a two-way player and now they're just going to be a pitcher or you know, guys who played three sports in high school and now they're just going to be a baseball player. Like all of these things are important in putting together a plan for them to improve. Are you, um, I, I kind of cut you, this, this became a, we got, we got into a whole nother conversation <laughs> when I asked you how involved are you in your yeah. players' strength training programs? So initially, like going back several years, I, I was the strength and conditioning coach for a long time. Um, Now, uh, a group here in Sacramento that trains a lot of professional athletes um, of all sports. Uh, they work with a pitching development group that's here in town called Optimum Athletes. And so we hire one of their strength coaches um, to be kind of the boots on the ground guy. Now, with that being said, um, I always see the programs and I'm always adding or subtracting to the programs um, more on an individual basis than anything else. Um, like I'm not going through and telling our strength guy, hey, I think this lift sucks. I go through and go, hey, I think these guys need this more than this. Or can we adjust this rep scheme for this guy? Or can we, mm -hmm. you know, we're going to lower the weight a little bit. And get him moving, like he used to, moving the bar as fast as possible. Do you know how valuable that is? That you actually can do that. That's like um, that. That for a, a strength coach. I mean, unless he's got a really big ego and he doesn't want to actually listen to something that a pitching coach has to say. Um, that's a really, really valuable. That's like the. That's like the conversation that a strength coach and a and a, and a PT have. Like when I get PTs that don't want to talk to you because you're a strength coach. I tell those guys, you might be with the wrong PT, man. Like, you know, yeah. right? And, and the, if you get strength coaches that don't want to talk to you, that's – especially a guy who knows what he's talking about like you, that's a really, really – that's like a that's like a gift to have a – being able to program for a group of pitchers. And the guy, the pitching coach, actually knows what he's talking about. He can give you feedback. Yeah, and I try – you know, one of the things that, that in the last – I guess it's been fairly recent last couple of years too is just trying to schedule a lifting a little bit better so that you know if it's a day where the guy is going to be doing some high intensity throwing uh, 
That should be a pretty hard lifting day so that the next day when he's not doing the high intensity throwing, he, he can relax, right? The yeah, lift yeah. is not going to crush him. Consolidate uh, that stress. Consolidate yeah, I, I that stress. That's, that's uh, how I heard Eric Cressy describe it, like consolidate the stressors. And <clears> I think that's a really important thing. I think, again, kind of the old school way of thinking was, you know, crush the lift, take it easy on the throwing because you're tired from your lift, right? And then, and then go out the next day and like really cut it loose now because you didn't lift today. Right. Reality Not is like, <laughs> you're just emptying the tank and never filling it back up. Exactly. And like, I, you know, I think all the evidence when we start looking at how pitchers get hurt, all the evidence really points to one thing and it's fatigue. Like you can say, well, that those mechanics suck or that kid looks like he's weak or but all of those things, if you think about it, CNS, all just contribute to fatigue. Yeah. If you have bad mechanics, then you're going to fatigue faster. You know, if you're weak, you're going to fatigue faster. If you're immobile, you're going to have bad mechanics. And then yeah. you're going to so, fatigue you know, faster. You, you, you can just, when you can try to eliminate fatigue as much as possible or make sure that when guys are really going to cut it loose, that they aren't fatigued. Again, that's another box that you're hoping to check. That's a really, that's a really huge thing that I love about VBT. Um, if we're looking for a bar speed today that that uh, that is equivalent to seventy five percent of your one rep max, um, today we're looking for six point point six zero meters per second. Um, you come in today and you know you put your weight, you do your warm ups, and then you put your weight on your deadlift and you deadlift, and it's it's slower. Um, don't continue on through with that weight. Your CNS yeah. is a little drained today. So yep. it's managing re residual stress and fatigue. And that's what, what you just said. VBT is unbelievable for that. You know what? We're looking for 0 0.60 today. You're at 0.55. You got one more chance to drive this. If not, we're taking the weight down. And yeah. then we're working within – because that, that, that one rep max fluctuates 18 to 20% a day based off of fatigue. And it's the same thing when you're pitching. How many yep. pitches? You know, maybe we're not throwing as many pitches today. Maybe if we're doing pull downs in a velo phase um, and we're giving them enough rest and we're starting to see a decline, you're done for the day, you yep. know? So that's great. That's really awesome um, that you do that. Once again, it's like it's, it's a blessing to have guys that are, that are that knowledgeable about strength and conditioning being pitching coaches. Um, <clears throat> I saw on your resume in LinkedIn that you also are a link listed as a mental skills coach. Can you talk a little bit about that and how you incorporate it into your program? Yeah. So, that, so we've always um, like going back to, you know, the eighties with Jerry and uh, like understood the importance of the, the psychology of being an athlete. Right. I don't like to say psychology because I'm not a psychologist. I, I, I don't have a degree in psychology. Uh, and I think when you start talking about psychology, you can kind of turn some people away. Like they're worried about you're going to, you know, lay yeah, them down yeah. on the leather on the couch. couch. Yeah. Talk about their childhood. Like that's not, that, that comes up, trust me, but it's more about developing skills that you can go to to get you ready to compete. Um, and so, you know, mental toughness is part of that and being able to focus is part of that. And like every coach ever has told players that they need to be mentally tough. They've told coach, they've told their players that they have to focus, but no one ever coaches it. No one ever teaches it. No one makes it part of practice. They just expect people to be able to do it. To me, the comparison would be like, if you want someone to be a really good hitter, but you don't let them take batting practice. Like, how is that? That's never going to work, right? right? So so we have um, starting, like, so I, I really get turned on to it when uh, Ken Revisa would come and visit with our team. Um, Ken is kind of like the, you know, the godfather of sports psych. Um, and before he got really famous and, um, you know, was working for all these professional teams, he he would come to Sacramento and he would spend time with our team. And to me, it, and I, I still, I think about this a lot because it had as big an impact on me as a person 
and the way I live and the way I think as it did for the players. Um, and so I, I'm, because of that, I immediately saw the value that it could bring when it came to performance on the field. And so um, that's kind of the other hat I wear. I'm the sports psych guy for the Sacramento City College baseball team. And so um, we, we've developed the curriculum. Uh, we, we have weekly meetings where we go over um, a specific topic related to, to mental skills or a mental skill, whether it be visualization, um, breathing patterns, um, pre-pitch routines, pre-game routines, um, you know, just anything you could think of in that area. And then uh, every day following that weekly meeting, there is something that I've written up that relates back to that specific topic for the week. Um, and then also every, every, because, you know, use technology as much as you can, every morning they get another message from me that goes right to their phone and I time it so they get it right as they're coming out of the weight room. Uh, and I do that for a couple of reasons. One, That's the first thing they all great. do when they get out of the weight room is go right to their phone so they're going to see it. But two, they're together. And so they're going to see it as a team. Yeah. They're going to go, oh, did you see this? And, you know, I, I, I calculated it. They, they're probably exposed to 300 different things during the course of the school year. And I think if there's 15 of those 300 that really resonate with them, that's, that's a win win. Awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, and so, you know, the way we uh, getting back to practice, um, you know, we have breathing practice on our practice plan. Like there's, uh, you know, like when we're playing catch, they're our catch play. Like I'm going around in between to guys and I'm just asking them, hey, what are we doing right now, right this second with this pitch? What are you trying to do? With this throw, what are you trying to do? And they get blank stares a lot of times, which is what you would expect when someone's new to it and never really been coached through it. Right. Um, well, why don't we think about this? Why don't we like make this part of your routine? And let's make sure, you know, if the routine completely goes to hell, worst case scenario, make sure you take a nice, long, slow, deep breath before you get ready to pitch. And that has a huge impact just by doing that, that one thing. And so like the whole idea of, it, of the mental skills really is finding a way for guys to be present in what it is they're doing. Like everyone in our program is good enough to perform at a high level, but not everyone does. Right. Right. And it's these things and your ability to, I think there's a buy-in part. I mean, I think there are guys who just think that I'm so tough that I, I don't need this. Um, I think there are guys who have figured out their own way. Like a few years ago, we had a, a kid who played at a really high level. He played in AAA. Um, and, you know, we're, we're talking about these things. And he goes, you know, I never did this. I never believed it. I never liked it. He said, I just got in the box and I just wanted to embarrass the pitcher and I want to prove to him that I was better than him. I'm like, yeah, that's it. That's it. That's your version of yeah. it. Like, that's perfect. Yeah, you didn't have to take a deep breath. You didn't have to do all these other things, but you came up with your own version of getting yourself to be present. And it was to tell the pitcher, hey, I'm better than you. That's right. that's the whole thing, right? That's fantastic. And so we just, we, I think, you know, I think as much as anything is you just have to have the conversation of, hey man, look, there's a whole lot of guys across this country who are 88 to 90 with a good breaking ball and throw right-handed. Like, what are you going to do to make yourself different? How are you going to separate yourself? And these are the things. Like, in, in, at every level, you know, when you, and you see them, but, you know, as you start going up in levels, there gets to a point where, like, physically, everyone's the same. Yep. You know, you, you take out the top 
five percent from the major leagues and you take out your trouts and your otanis and you know whoever you want to take out right the top five to maybe seven percent of those guys and you compare everyone else to guys in triple a there's not a huge difference not physically mentally mentally it is completely different you know this game is there's so much failure involved um there's so much downtime involved um it's just it, – it's really taxing mentally. Um, you know, in a football game, stuff happens and you're moving. Every, every, everyone's going, right? Even if the ball is going to the other side of the field, you're, you're still running over there, right? You don't yeah. have that that sort of downtime. To, th- uh, to overthink things. Overthink it, yeah. Yeah, you know, and I think you – know, one of the things that, I, that you hear a lot of that drives me crazy is don't think. Just don't think. That's the worst advice you can give to somebody. Because when you don't, it's not like our brain just goes blank, right? There's no like whiteboard with nothing on it. That never happens. When we don't control what we're thinking about, our brain tends to start going to the negative. And I, you know, from what I've read and it, it, I think that's kind of a genetic thing, like biologically, when we were living in caves, you know, thousands and thousands of years ago, we had to worry about the bad stuff right. because if we didn't, we were going to die. And those endorphins that get released when you release bad thoughts are the same ones that are released when they're good thoughts. Your body doesn't really know. Um, right. Your body doesn't really know whether it's reacting, it's releasing endorphins from a stress reaction of a, of, a, of, a, of a great moment or a bad moment. That's why a lot of times, like speaking of the mental attitude, that difference between a really great pro guy and a triple A guy or a double A guy is the fact that giving up that home run, walk it off and don't let that emotion trigger endorphins because you can get addicted to that stress release from a bad reaction. Yeah. yeah. And and I think, you know, you mentioned emotion. And I think that guys try to turn that off. Like baseball is such a, has a history of like being stoic and, you know, they, they act like you've done it before. Um, but I think when you try to turn off the emotion, you're just creating more stress. Right. Because now you're telling yourself, don't be nervous, don't be scared, you know, don't be anxious. Yeah. And you're trying to fight that off while you're trying to strike somebody out. Yeah. And you're also thinking about, wow, is it working? Am I being nervous? Am I right. am I, like now, now you're thinking about it and it's just it's a it's a whole it's a whole spiral. That's that's awesome advice. Um, what what I've learned today is how valuable a JUCO experience can be for a player that gets into a program such as yours, where they're you're just you're just firing from all the cylinders. Um, do you have summing it all up? Do you have any general advice for those seeking to play JUCO? Yeah, I, I think like any college decision. Um, you have to do some research. Um, and I think you have to understand what it is that is important to you. Um, because if you come to a, a, if you go to a successful program, you know, a program with a, with a winning tradition, a tradition of moving guys along, you have to understand that there are going to be other good players in that program. And I, I think that I know that we've recruited kids who did not want to come to Sac City because they were worried about not playing. And I, I get it. Like, no one wants to sit on the bench. But at the same time, if you don't think you can play at the local community college, you can't also think that you're going to go play for the Yankees. Right. It's not like, you know, we're, we're hiding a bunch of Major League All-Stars on our bench. Right. And so I think when you're when you're doing your JUCO research, like look and see, you know, who really does talk about development. Because any coach you talk to is going to tell you if you come here, you're going to get better. That's what I read. 
that's what I grabbed from this whole conference, this whole podcast today. When, when you're looking for a JUCO, um, if you're going to go to a JUCO, you should go to a JUCO and you should make sure that they're going to develop you. And yeah, I ask them like, what is your plan to help pitchers get better? How do you coach infielders? Like, don't tell me that I'm going to get better without telling me how it's going to happen. Like That's what is advice. the process? You know, and if they can't, you know, if they talk about using rap soto, ask them how. What do they do? It's like specifically, um, if they talk about, yeah, we we have a velo program. Ask them what it is. What is your velo program? I've already done that. It didn't work. What else do you have? Like I threw weighted balls. I didn't gain any velo. What's next? You know, if they don't have an answer, well, maybe it's not the best place for you. Right. Know why you're going there, right? That's... Yeah. You know, hey. We're going to get you stronger. Okay, how? Like, what does that look like? Right. Uh, you know, I, I think I think the other thing, too, is talking to players. I think is a big, really important piece of the recruiting puzzle. I really do. Um, you know, ask guys who have gone through there. Uh, if you're trying to sign a professional contract, how many guys have, have signed out of there? If you want to go to a Power 5 type of school, how many power five type players have they produced? Um, you know, how many, when their guys transfer somewhere, right? Let's say they go to a good division one school. Do they stay there? <laughs> you know, or, or are they at a D2 or a D3 the next year? You know, are they productive when they get there? You know, I, I, the, the, I think the greatest compliment that our program has received since I've been there was we had a kid go to a power five school and their assistant coach called me. He said, your guy is the most prepared junior college player we've ever had in our program. That's, that speaks volumes because that's well, – that was just like – I got chills. That's like, a phone that was, call that I get from coach, college coaches all the time. They're like, dude, you, you, we have your, – your, our freshmen show up from your place, and they're, they're so in such better – movement pattern wise and they know so much about the weight room that they actually become leaders at a young age in the weight room yeah. because they're so prepared that's a great that's a i love that as well that's like that makes everything i do like completely worth it you know what i mean when i get for those sure. calls for um, sure one, 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 like, go ahead. i think the other thing too you know when you when that happens like Four-year schools are going to be interested in your athletes, right? Because they know that they're getting someone who's prepared. Same thing with us. Yeah. You know, we send a kid to wherever and he does well and he's a good person and he performs and he's well coached and he knows what he's doing. It just opens the door for the next kid who wants to go to that school, right? And the opposite is also true. Like a kid goes to four-year school and he's a jackass and he doesn't do what he's supposed to and he doesn't do well in school. Like that coach is not going to call you back, right? Right. Yeah. And so it's important for us when we send our guys out that we send them out prepared and they're prepared for whatever level it is that they're going to. You know, I, I'm sure that I probably have – been too hard on guys when it comes to sending them out at times because I just don't think it's going to be the right fit. Um, you know, and every Division One school has their, you know, their kind of guy they're looking for, and I think it's up to us to try to make that happen. We've been talking to Descahe Bombery. Did I say it right? You did. Descahe Bombery. I love that name. That is, like, <laughs> amazing. Otherwise known as Coach Bomber, Coach, how can how can people get a hold of you? How can they follow you? What's going on? Uh, I'm on uh, Twitter and Instagram. Um, that's probably the best way. I post more Twitter stuff during the season than in the summer. It's uh, at Coach underscore Bomber. Um, you know, I, again, if guys want my email address, it's uh, – Bomber, B O M B E R D, at S C C dot Los Rios, R I O S dot E D U. Um, and I will tell you that, Nuns, I try really, really hard 
to help as many young coaches as possible, parents, the whole thing. Because I, I, you know, I've been doing this a long time, um, and I've had some great, great people help me. Um, and I, you know, sounds corny, but I, I do want to try to pay that back. Uh, so I got a couple of young coaches in the last year, just kind of email. I never met them before. They both emailed me and like, Hey, um, can we get on a zoom and just talk pitching? Absolutely. 100%. So, um, I'm always down to do stuff like that. That's why I love doing podcasts. I think, you know, people, I, I hope I have something to offer that, that might help somebody. Um, you know, even if it's just one person, then that's, that's good for me. I feel I feel the exact same way. Uh, that's why I actually started doing these. It, I, it was my way of kind of trying to give back by finding guys that I thought could help other people. You can uh, you can reach me at at Nunzio Signore. Um, you can also reach my facility at RPP underscore baseball. Our website is www.rocklandpeakperformance.com. Um, I have a book on velocity-based training um, released by Human Kinetics, and you can get it on Amazon as well. It's called Velocity-Based Training, How to Apply Science, Technology, and Data to Maximize Performance. And I would love to thank Coach Bomber for being here today. Um, this has been a really, really uh, great experience for me. I appreciate it, Nons. I appreciate all you do. I mean, you pump out some some really good content that that you make available to everybody and i think um you know i think that's kind of becoming the wave of the future like good people doing good things just for the sake of doing a good thing not you know expecting something in a paycheck at the end of it you know and I, yeah. I i think that i think we can all help kind of move the needle a little bit if we are just willing to put ourselves out there yeah man so guys thank you for tuning into the uh behind the scenes podcast We'll see you on the next one.